This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So it's been a long time since we've done a Q&A, and I was reminded of this by some Patreon supporters, and I thought, let's do a Q&A. So I left the questions to the Patreon supporters, and they could upvote each other's questions, and I've picked a bunch. And we're going to answer them pretty quickly uh, and talk about a whole bunch of different stuff. Let's go. What's your coffee-related guilty pleasure that you find hard to admit? It's difficult now, because for a long time I would have said the Starbucks Frappuccino, because I had a soft spot for that particular thing, and I had a couple of instances in my life of being, like, stuck somewhere at two in the morning and needing to drive for a couple more hours and just needing some sort of coffee, and, and that just hitting the spot. But I had one a couple of weeks ago, and it was not... it was not that good. So I'm kind of conflicted now. I don't really know what a truly guilty pleasure is. I think they're just all pleasures, and I don't feel enough guilt. Maybe I was just raised a certain way. What's the most what the hell is going on here moment that I have had in a coffee shop. I've had quite a number of the where is my coffee because someone's worked out it's me and they're freaking out and they're just making the same espresso over and over and over and over and over again in the hope of just somehow nailing it into this perfect shot despite the fact that coffee can't be that good. Like, I, there's no coffee in the world worth waiting 20 minutes for, right? There's a period of time where you'll wait for something if it's worth it, but at some point the wait time exceeds the capacity of coffee to be excellent. I, I think the other one that springs to mind is I walked into a coffee shop in the US and the barista or the person at the counter was like, oh no, not you, and they just turned around and walked away and just left the register and just left. And uh, someone very confused from the back of the shop had to come out and kind of make me coffee and had no idea who I was, as this person had just abandoned ship. So that was kind of uh, weird. Are you planning to do a worldwide tasting this year? Uh, I really hoped to do something. The world's largest coffee tasting got really big last year. It was 17,500 kits went out, and that was logistically awful, like really unpleasant for everyone involved. The Squirmal team worked really, really, really hard, and I don't know if I could ask that of them again. We had help with logistics too, and even then, it was just, it was just bad. I do want to do a global tasting of sorts, where the logistics are totally different, but, but that requires travel be a thing, and a host of other logistical challenges, but I am working on something. Will it be this year? Probably not. Can you post something about roasting coffee uh, at home? equipment, guides, techniques, you know, can I do some home roasting stuff? Now, obviously I have some experience and understanding with coffee roasting as a whole. I haven't really delved into home roasting in a while, but it is pretty high up on the list of, of kind of big projects for the channel. The one thing I know is true is that if you think espresso is is like too much as a hobby, coffee roasting takes that and, and, and adds a, an order of magnitude more pain in every single way. It is more frustrating, more annoying, it will drag you down a, a deeper kind of upgrade-itis kind of curve. It, it's not a kind of saving money kind of thing. Like if you think making your own cappuccino in the morning saves you money compared to going to a coffee shop, you quickly understand that's not true. And the same is true with roasting. All of that said, yeah, you can save money if you roast your own coffee, that's true, but it is an enormous investment of your time and how you value your time and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I do want to do some roasting stuff, for sure. I want to do like a series of different stuff, the basics of home roasting, the kind of ideas behind coffee roasting, some more equipment kind of stuff. It, it, it is slowly underway. I own some interesting roasters now, but, but it's going to be a while, if I'm honest. Natural or washed? Washed. What do you do when you get to the end of a bag of coffee and there aren't enough beans for your usual dose? Is blending those last few beans uh, with some other beans a travesty? Is it better than just wasting them? Anything is better than wasting them, so don't throw them away. Uh, yes, make a blend. Make a blend because blends are interesting. And again, it should be a great topic for a video. Blends should be almost more than the sum of their parts, and when you start to sort of accidentally blend, you'll see that two coffees that should work together sometimes kind of don't. Some things that shouldn't work really kind of do, uh, and it's just a fun little experiment with no real downside. So 100% blend a little of the old with a little of the new, see how it tastes, learn a thing, discover a thing, uh, and, and then enjoy the next bag of coffee and have some fun. So I'm going to summarize this next question because it's quite long, and it's basically do I have a kind of opinion on a travel setup? Now I have been slowly acquiring travel-y type things, because I really want to kind of work out what my ultimate travel setup is, right? It needs to be incredibly lightweight, it needs to be kind of everything. I'll show you what I'm not aiming for, which is which is this. This is very nice, don't get me wrong, this is very nice indeed. This is a, a travel kind of case of, of stuff from Time More, they sent it to me, um, but it's just... There you go. 
it's all of the things. You, you've got your grinder and you, you've got your kettle and you've got like uh, papers for your pour over and you've got little bean cellars here. It's everything you would need. I just don't know how to pack that into anything, right? Uh, it, it, do I put it in my suitcase? It's kind of weird for my hand luggage. It's got a little handle. Am I supposed to like briefcase it through the airport? Or I don't, I don't know. It's really nice, but these kind of things, I just don't really feel like they work. It's a nice kind of gift set more than a travel set to me. So one second. These are some of the kind of things that I've been buying because I'm kind of curious about them. So uh, this is, uh, this was sent to me actually, it's called a Primula. It's a sort of reusable uh, nylon mesh pour over filter, which is kind of interesting. It's completely flat, so super easy to travel with. And then you've kind of got the, um, the jigsaw puzzle of this particular thing, the Tetra Drip, which you kind of, you know, build out into being a little kind of cone brewer. That's kind of interesting. I'm buying random scales. Someone sent me a link to these. These are, um, where are they? They unfold and you could you know, put them down and, and weigh stuff on them and put things on them. That's kind of weird and interesting. So I, I'll get there. I don't camp much. I haven't been camping in a long time. Uh, I'm not against camping, I just haven't been for a long time, but I am slowly trying to find the smallest, neatest setup possible that actually makes great coffee. They do also ask what my ideal vacation is. I, I feel like, I, I don't know, it's, it's like asking about a last meal at this point. It feels so alien and so impossible to pick one thing. Anything, anything would be good. I feel like I've, I'm not very good at vacations. I, I forgot how to do them for a few years when I worked too much and that was very unhealthy. And then I feel like I got back in the rhythm and now I've forgotten how to do vacations again and they're hard to do and I don't know. So I, I, I have no idea. Anything would be good. There's lots of places I want to go. The world is too interesting to, to, to not want to see it all. So this question, I, I just thought was a really interesting question. So, uh, you know, they highlight that I made a video about how to brew better dark roasts and it's almost like how to enjoy dark roasts more if you're a light roast lover. But what about the opposite way around? Like how to enjoy light roasts if you like dark roasts? That's a really interesting way of doing things and actually a really interesting question. And I like it a lot because it sort of repositions who's right in the, the kind of preference world. The thing for me, the boring answer to me is you would just want to have a lot of buffer in there because I suspect the thing that, that, that people who like dark roasts don't like about light roast is all that acidity. And I think you could use brew water that had a lot more bicarbonate in it uh, and therefore mute out the acidity while still having a lot of flavor and aroma from the brew. Or you could do the thing I did a video on once where you could just make up a solution uh, of bicarbonate and then just add a little bit to your coffee instead of sugar to sort of mute that acidity. That, that I think would be a, an, an interesting way to kind of make light roasts more enjoyable to people who like dark roasts. You know, I would brew, dose up a little bit more. I think that people who like dark roasts like a little bit more intensity. So I'd brew 65, 70 grams a liter as well. Another good question. Are we making espresso too complicated to actually enjoy the process? Doing too much for diminished returns. I just realized that RDT, which is the droplet technique to stop the static uh, into a basket with a paper filter on the bottom. I use a tool to WDT, which is the Weiss distribution technique to declump it, uh, distribute with an OCD, spray the puck, level with the tamper, put a B plus screen uh, and then make a coffee. Is that too much? And I would say maybe if you don't enjoy ritual and process. My feeling is we're getting closer and closer and closer to really understanding the kind of minimalist path to great espresso. You know, in the past we were doing things like, like pulling volumetric shots based on kind of how they looked. When we moved to weighing grams in and grams out, that, that made everything much simpler, much easier, much more direct. Uh, and we got rid of a bunch of kind of nonsense around coffee making. And I think the other thing that we know now is that channeling is the big challenge. You know what I mean? And so, so declumping your grounds is a, a solid and sensible step to help reduce channeling. I don't know about the distribution tools that, that are out there, the kind of spinny ones. I, I'm, I'm still not particularly convinced on them, but I do think distribution of coffee and declumping it and, and those kind of tools are useful. The, the sort of wire tools I, I like much more than the spinny, spinny tools. Um, I say spinny, spinny too much. I think it's easy to, to sort of endlessly try and optimize. I'm personally pulling in the direction of what is the least work I can do to get great espresso. You know, and, and I think we learn from each other along the way. Now, I had a lot of questions about decaf and, and I think I've talked in various places about this. There is a big decaf project. It is, it is enormous in scale and scope. And so it's slow. And, and and it's going to involve logistics on multiple con continents. It's going to involve enormous amounts of coffee and money. And it's mildly terrifying, but there are some great people helping me with it. So there will be a big series, a big kind of experience around decaf because it needs, I think, to be experiential. Uh, all of your decaf questions will be answered 
I just don't know when with the state of global logistics and also travel being what it is. But I will say decaf can be great, delicious, diverse, wonderful. I just shot a video that involved decaf for someone else's second channel that we're coming out fairly soon that, that I feel will hopefully prompt a bit more discussion about how good decaf can be, because it can be really, really good if everyone cares and each stage of the process is done really well. So this one's a, a bit tricky, which is what are your thoughts on these sustainability claims that all roasters make? How can we as consumers know what claims actually mean? How to differentiate between what's genuine and what is little more than marketing? There was a lot of likes on this question from the rest of the group, which made me feel like you wanted an answer here. The truth is you realistically can't tell, right? You, you can't meaningfully audit those companies and there's a, there's a quantity of trust required to believe the claims. And whether they've earned your trust in a myriad of ways or not is kind of up to the relationship you have with that roaster. I'm not saying I would be distrustful of anything anyone says at face value, but I would be aware it's really hard to audit that stuff. And yeah, it maybe helps if they're a B Corp, but I've certainly seen questionable B Corps in my time. You know, it, you know, different certifications answer different questions, but ultimately, it's almost impossible to really tell who's following through and who's not. And I wish that wasn't the case. And I wish I could give you like a, a nice little hacky shortcut to it, but I, I can't. So I'm sorry. That's a sort of terrible answer in every way, but it is what it is. I like this question. What would your advice be for someone who's looking to keep improving their home setup? Do not upgrade to the thing that everyone is talking about for the sake of upgrading. Do not upgrade because you can or you can afford it. Upgrade to buy a thing that fixes a specific problem that you are having, right? Like you need to understand what's holding back your current coffee making experience and solve for that. That's the right pathway. And honestly, it, it, oftentimes, it's going to be the coffee itself, or it's going to be the water treatment, or those kind of things that are actually the limiting factor on the quality of the coffee that you make at home, and probably not the machine or the grinder, really. You know, the incremental gains are so small for so much money at the top end of everything in this world, that, that unless it fixes a specific problem, I would be questioning what's motivating the upgrade. That's, that's my approach. How much time goes into making one of your videos, and what software do you use for editing? Um, I'm on a Mac. I'll go backwards on the answer here. I'm on a Mac, so we use Final Cut. Um, a couple of us edit here. Occasionally we work with external editors. Um, but yeah, here we edit on, on Final Cut because it's optimized for Macs. It's super fast. We think in Final Cut now, and so we can cut pretty quickly with it and intuitively, and we sort of cut similarly, Michael and I who edit. Um, so that's that. How much time goes into one of them? This this is a little easier, if we're honest. Like, I'm going to talk to the camera for a while, and then we're going to take that file and cut out all the bits where I make mistakes or spill coffee or just my hair looks wrong. Uh, and then we have a video. Uh, in other cases, shoots can last two, three days, sometimes more, and they can take a long time to put together and maybe a day or two to edit. Oh, yeah. And then I, I guess there's also researching, there's product testing. If, there's, if it's a product, it could have been used for a few days, a few weeks, in some cases, a few months. It really depends on, on the product and the nature of the review. Research, it can take time. Well, yeah, it, it, you know, getting a thumbnail down, that's something I'd like to get better at and titles and all of those kind of things. I'm glad to some extent we don't do like blog posts with everything too, because that would just, I think, be too much. But yeah, a good amount of time goes into everything, which is why I probably don't make more and probably should aspire to make less so I can invest more time per video and make fewer videos per month, but better videos per month. So it depends on the scope and the scale of the project. But but yeah, we, we will at some point do like a studio tour here, uh, if people want that, maybe on Instagram, and show you kind of what the setup is and what our kit is, what gear we use, if you want to know that stuff. So follow me on Instagram. I think it'll turn up there probably rather than YouTube. Um, yeah, we'll do that at some point. But yeah, we, we, we are not obsessed about that stuff. We just want it to go faster and easier. It's just about friction. That's our upgrade path. We're solving to reduce friction, go faster, go easier, go quicker, all of those things. That's what's meaningful to us, saving time. Which coffee-related thing do you feel people are wrong about on the internet most often and why? The thing that I think people are most often wrong about is that the idea of a singular best. A singular best coffee, a singular best brew or extraction of that coffee, a singular best grinder, a singular best machine. There is no best. There's not a single peak that you're driving towards. There's no shared destination. There are many, a myriad of them. We're all pulling in different directions. And I know I do comparisons and I try and pick a 
ultimate thing or the best thing, but that's why it's so heavily caveated that it's my best thing for my needs with my experiences as I've tested them, and yours might be different. And I really dislike it when people are like, no, that's not the best, this is the best. You know, that's not how you should do it, this is how you should do it. I, I think the idea of a singular ultimate thing is is wrong, frustrating, and the source of a lot of unnecessary conflict on the internet. Hey James, how are you? I mean, you like to keep your private life private, and that's very important. It's just some really challenging times, and I want to know how you're doing. Ultimately, I'm doing all right. I'm tired. I am pretty exhausted. I don't think that's an uh, unusual experience for many people here. I know some people are rested, and, and that's good. And, and I know a lot of people will probably hear this bit of the video and be like, look after yourself. All, all I'll say is, you too. Right? If you're telling me to just relax, chill, take some time, I hope you are doing the same for yourself, because you probably need it. But yeah, I would say I'm a little tired. I need to change the way I'm working. I think the pandemic has been intense. YouTube got big. Work got challenging outside of YouTube. Like, you know, the world was difficult and needed a lot of time and attention and, and stuff. Investment of thought and effort. So, yes, I'm a little bit tired, and, and vacationing is still not easy. So I'm trying to work that out, but I'm, I'm ultimately very good. I can very good. I have no real complaints at all. But thank you for asking, and I hope you're doing good too. Kind of connected. You have your fingers in so many pies. That's such a gross phrase. Uh, no disrespect to you. It, it's the phrase, but it's also kind of weird at this point. Uh, what does an average working day look like for you? I have no average day. I, I've not had an average day for the longest time. I don't know what an average day looks like anymore. Today, you know, what time is it now? It's like nearly four o'clock. This morning was like work, planning, strategy, plotting, working on the new studio space, all of that kind of stuff. This phone call is still to happen today, meetings. Tomorrow will be like a little bit of writing. I'm still trying to finish up a book. Uh, I'm giving a talk uh, at an event. You know, the day before yesterday, what was yesterday? Oh, I was like filming a video with someone else. Uh, I filmed a video with Tom Scott, of all people, which was lovely. Uh, and then just like meetings and stuff. I kind of bounce around. There's no normal. I, I just, I have a little bit of chaos and that's why I need some help managing my chaos and I have some good help, but I have no normal. I have no normal. It's every day is different. And some days that's wonderful and other days that is completely exhausting and frustrating. Again, I'm not complaining. I don't know if that's an answer. I don't know if I, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer this question. I, I don't even know what I do for a living anymore. It's all very confusing. When will we get the tiramisu recipe video? So this video is going to have at least two parts of it, and one of the parts involves me eating an enormous amount of tiramisu at different restaurants around London. And going to restaurants has only recently been vaguely sensible. Um, so that's kind of held it back. I still want to do this, but it involves, you know, I need to set a benchmark. I need to understand what I want tiramisu to be. I've eaten a lot of trashy tiramisu in my life. I've eaten some fancy tiramisu. I want to eat a whole lot more and really pay attention and then kind of decide where I want to go with my version. So I don't know, maybe this year, it could be this year. I, I would like to go and eat like 20 different tiramisus around London and feel incredibly ill afterwards. That would be, that would be good and take you with me. It's coming. Do you think coffee culture around the world is getting too similar? I sometimes have the feeling all coffee bars look the same. In some ways, yes, like there's a lot of the same and I feel like we don't, and we haven't historically celebrated, you know, people who experiment and take risks quite as much as we should. But then again, there's also the kind of culture that we exist in only really celebrates and pays attention to certain styles of businesses. You know, like, I feel like we, we, we pay our attention to certain styles of, of coffee bars and not necessarily to others. I think there's loads of different coffee bars and styles of stuff out there. They're just not considered cool or interesting or relevant to what we do. And I think that's a big mistake. And I, you know, when it comes to travel or even just in the UK and London, I'm still very interested in exploring coffee culture outside of the sort of narrow definition of modern specialty coffee because, you know, there are other ways to drink coffee and other cultures of coffee drinking that exist outside of this one. So, yeah, I think within modern specialty coffee, things can be a bit homogenous, but at the same time, we're not paying much attention to things outside of that kind of realm. I think the last question for today, which item you reviewed was the most difficult for you to give away? Like the one you would most liked to have kept? Well, I think you've watched the videos, you probably know the answer. At the end of the Ultimate Grinder showdown, I felt very sad giving all of them away, actually. I'd gotten very used to a life of very fancy grinders in the studio every day, and so uh, we bought an EG1 because we, you know, we loved having it here. We missed that, and, and the minute that it left and there was a gap, I, I, I sort of sent it away and ordered one, and there was, you know, a couple months before it shipped. You know, that leap forward in quality, that incremental gain was one thing, but g going back, actually, just felt 
harsher. And I'm not complaining about the grinders I was using in the meantime, but yeah, just having something that worked that way, that felt that way, just brought me a lot of pleasure. It's a, a very enjoyable grinder to use. So there'll be another Q&A soon. Keep your eyes out for where we'll kind of collect the questions from. But now there's a very short ad for this video's sponsor which is Squarespace. Now, if you need a website or a domain, then I would strongly recommend checking out Squarespace. You know you have an idea at the back of your mind, a little thing you'd like to build. You can just sign up for a free trial, and then you can start by picking one of their many different templates. You'll find something that kind of fits what you want to build, and then you can start to tweak it and adjust it. And actually, the editor on the back end makes all of that very easy. You can move things around, have it look exactly how you want it to look, but you're not starting on a blank page. You're not staring at nothingness and trying to fill it in. And once you hit publish, you know it's going to look good on every browser, every device. That is covered. There's 24-7 email support. There's nothing to patch or upgrade or worry about. You can sign up below for a free trial, and after 14 days when you're ready to launch, use code James Hoffman for 10% off any website or domain. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now I kind of want to hear from you. Am I wrong? Have I said something bizarre and weird in these responses? Do you have a preference? Are you a natural coffee person or a washed coffee person? Leave me a comment down below. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.